Okay, thank you very much, Sir Chukan and Brother Ling Huas for today's Sunday Puja Chanting. Back with us this week, we have Brother Ananda Fong to share on the lessons from the Mangala Sutta. Over to you, Brother Ananda. Uh, thank you, Didi Terrence. As mentioned, uh, today's topic is on the nurturing a blessed way of life. Just to start off, I will do a very, very short puja. Namo tasa bhagavato arhato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arhato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arhato samma sambuddhasa. Buddhang dhammang sanggang namasami. For most of us, life is about wanting to have this and that. That means what we desire. And in the Ita Sutta, from the Anguttara Nikaya Book of Five, the Buddha addressed some lay people. House Lord, there are these five things that are desirable, beloved, and agreeable, but difficult to obtain in the world. What are the five? Long life, beauty, happiness, fame, and rebirth in heaven. This is, for some of us uh, in the modern day, probably the list will be lengthened. But these are essentially what over the 2,600 over years, people in the ancient times up to now have longed for. Of these five things, house lord, the Buddha said, I do not teach that they are to be obtained through prayer, nor through wishing. If one could obtain them through prayer or wishing, who would not obtain them? So this is an important aspect. The Buddha did not teach that the, all these, the above mentioned, long life, beauty, happiness, fame, and rebirth in heaven are to be obtained via prayers. Now for a noble disciple, house lord, who wishes to have long life, beauty, happiness, fame, and rebirth in heaven, it is not proper that he should pray for all these. He should rather follow a way of life that is conducive to long life, beauty, happiness, fame, and rebirth in heaven. So the key thing is follow a way of life, not prayer. By following such a path, you obtain all this that he, he desires or welcomes in his life. So clearly, when we say Buddhists do not pray, this is in reference to what the advice the Buddha gave in this particular sutta and a few others. The key issue is follow a way of life. In the last time we met, we were covering a topic titled A Way of Life with Blessings, also lessons from the Mangala Sutta. And in that particular session, we talked about blessings number four, five, and six. As most of us are aware, Mangala Sutta contains 38 blessings. And the last time we met, we only touched on blessing number four, five, and six. Today, we continue. Talk about blessings number seven, eight, nine, and ten, covering profound learning, proficiency in one's work, well-learned moral discipline, and gracious, kindly speech. Now, you will note that in the Mangala Sutta, a lot of the advices from blessing number one onwards is a gradual slope, is uh, what it called, uh, advising us to establish in our mundane lives the proper way of leading it. And at some point, there will be a need to uh, improve our spiritual development. And ultimately, towards blessing number 36, 37, 38, we are talking about enlightenment. So it's a gradual training of sorts as listed in the Mangala Sutta. And here, we, today, we cover 7, 8, 9, and 10. There will be a lot of overlap with, in some of the suttas or, or, or examples I quote. So to have much learning or ample learning, or in some translations, they call it profound learning. So even for Buddhist monks, those who enter the path uh, as monastics or even as lay people, the first step is to learn what the Buddha taught, not what other people say, but what the Buddha taught. 
So if anybody were to ask you, uh, uh, this such and such a way of doing things is part of the Buddhist way of life. And uh, it would, you would not be wrong if you were to ask, what did the Buddha say about this aspect? Uh, quote, requesting a quote to the particular advice in the Nikayas and so on. Such a question is important because we need to find out whether it actually came from the Buddha or was somebody's, uh, what I call, own thinking or wise thinking. Now, in the Mangala Sutta, now here taking from a commentary, the great, the great discourse on blessings, the Maha Mangala Sutta in Theravada Buddhism by Dr. Ari uh, Obeye Sekara, he says, it is a blessing to have a quite correct knowledge as much as possible that can be used in both mundane and supra-mundane activities. Now, to be used in mundane, which means we, as we are, when we are born, we do not know a lot of things. We need to acquire knowledge, simple things like A for apple, B for ball, and so on. Learn the language, whichever language you are born into. You need to learn uh, one plus one equals to two, and so on. And all other sciences and uh, stuff in the mundane world so that you can lead a proper life. Super mundane activities cover the spiritual aspects. So continuing, in the olden days, knowledge could be received only through listening to others. Now, this is important because in India in those days, writing was not common. There was no paper in India at the time, unlike in China, where who in the Chinese invented paper. So listening was the only way. So when the suttas mentioned uh, the disciples listening to the Buddha, they will actually also mean learning from the Buddha. Okay. So it doesn't mean that you must always only just use your ears, but you can also read. Of course, today we have books, we have other medias. So talking about listening to others, but now it is possible to attain knowledge from various other sources, such as books and electronic media. And on the right, we have a picture of uh, what I call an icon, Norbu, a Buddhist uh, artificial intelligence platform in which you can actually learn from other than uh, Buddhist websites that uh, give teachings uh, and other media for us to learn more about what the Buddha taught. The knowledge acquired should be utilized for one's benefit and welfare in this life and future lives and also to cultivate one's spiritual journey towards liberation. Now, in, on this page, the Dhamma Savana Sutta, we're talking about listening to the Dhamma from the Anguttara Nikaya Book of Five. The Buddha talks about why is it good to listen to the Dhamma? What are the rewards? But in other words, what are the rewards for learning the Dhamma also, not just listening? So one hears or learns what one has not learned, heard, or learned before. One clarifies what one has heard before or learned before. One gets rid of doubt. One's views are made straight. One's mind grows serene. So these are the five rewards in listening to the Dhamma or learning the Dhamma. So clearly, the Buddha encourages us to, to learn to listening and to other various medias. In the Parabhava Sutta, Sutta on downfall, the, the direct opposite of the Mangala Sutta, the Mangala Sutta is a Sutta on blessing, what is very good fortunate for us, what is uh, what we all want. But Parabhava is a Sutta on downfall. The Buddha lists these many, many uh, downfall aspects. But in this case, like in the Mangala Sutta, the Sutta was the result of a deity coming to Jetavana Monastery at Savati uh, to ask the Buddha some questions. And the Parabhavadu Sutta starts off with, thus have I heard once the Buddha was dwelling at another Pindika's monastery in the Jeta Grove near Savati. Now when the night was far spent, a certain deity whose surpassing splendor illuminated the entire Jeta Grove, came to the presence of the Exalted One and drawing near, respectfully saluted him and stood at one side. Standing thus, he addressed the Buddha in verse. 
and the deity said, having come here with our questions to the Buddha, we ask the O Gotama about man's decline. So it was quite similar also in the Mangalo Sutta. Mangalo Sutta came about because of questions from deities. Now, there are many, there's a long list of downfalls, but here we move straight to the topic of today. Being fond of sleep, fond of company, indolent, lazy, and irritable. This is the cause of one's downfall. Why? When a person is fond of sleep, fond of company, indolent, lazy, and irritable, they dispense or doesn't bother to learn anything useful in their mundane life or in their spiritual life. And this is an important aspect. So if you do not learn, it causes problems. And downfall is not somebody's making, it's not the devil's making, it is your own making if you practice all these downfall lists. In another sutta, the Ganaka Moggallana Sutta, uh, discourse to Ganaka Moggallana. This is a lay person. In fact, he's an accountant. And the sutta is quite interesting. Now, thus have I heard at one time the Buddha was staying at Savati in the palace of Mingara's mother in the eastern monastery. Mingara's mother is the name of uh, uh, Visaka, uh, uh, what I call father-in-law. And uh, she, Visaka, being a very rich lady, she had already uh, donated to establish the eastern monastery in Savati. So as you know, as, like in the previous page, Savati also had the famous Jetavana monastery. Uh, continuing, then the Brahman, Ganaka Moggallana, approached the Lord. Having approached, he exchanged greetings with the Lord. Just as good Gautama in this palace of Migara's mother, there can be seen a gradual training, a gradual doing, a gradual practice. That is to say, as far as the last flight of stairs. So too, God Kotama, for those Brahmans, there can be seen a gradual training, a gradual doing, a gradual practice. That is to say, in the study of the Vedas. So here, the accountant, Ganaka Moggallana, is starting off by mentioning that everything is gradual. There's training, there's doing, there's practice and so on in the flight of stairs. And in the bottom left of the page, we talk about the study of the Vedas. Very important those days for the Brahmanical society. So too, good Gautama, for those archers that can be seen, a gradual uh, practice and doing and so on. That is to say in archery. So here we are talking about for those who want to learn archery, there needs to be a gradual training, a gradual practice and so on. Now, here the bottom pictures show the various uh, modern ways in which we train uh, newbies in how to, uh, what I call, in archery. And uh, Ganaka Moggallana continued. So too, God Gautama, for us, those whose livelihood is calculation, there can be seen a gradual training, a gradual practice, that is to say in accountancy. For when we get a pupil, God Gautama, we first of all make him calculate one, one, two, twos, three, threes, four, fours, five, five, six, six, seven, sevens, eight, eights, nine, nines, ten, tens. And we, good Kotoma, also make him calculate a hundred. Now, is it not possible, good Kotoma, to lay down a similar gradual training, gradual doing, gradual practice in respect of this Dhamma and discipline? And the Buddha replied, it is possible, Brahman, to lay down a gradual training, a gradual doing, a gradual practice in respect of this Dhamma and Vinaya. Now, here, notice I ended that particular paragraph with dot, dot, dot. The sutta continues in which the Buddha actually elaborates or lists down the overall uh, training syllabus for a monastic. And we can take lessons from this particular sutta also. But the key point with respect to much learning is that in all endeavors, in mundane life, as well as in spiritual life, there are uh, what I call syllabuses. There are things which we have to do. 
And in the bottom paragraph, at the, uh, at the bottom of this page, it's clear that to learn Buddhism, to practice Buddhism, that the key word is to practice, there is the need to train, to do. It is not to pray. Okay, so Buddhism is about doing, training, and practice so that you can be proficient in the Dhamma Vinaya of Gautama the Buddha. Now, moving on to be skillful in handicraft. Of course, in those days, uh, most of the way in which people earn their mundane livelihood was through handicraft, uh, working with their hands and so on, with their legs and all that. Only in the accountants where we, they use their minds a little bit to do calculations and so on. But of course, fast forward to the modern day, 21st century, we have a lot of knowledge workers, okay? Not just accountants, but we have software engineers, design engineers, structural engineers, civil engineers, electrical engineers, and so many other kinds of uh, softer skills, not just handicraft. But this particular aspect is to be skillful in all these uh, crafts, whether it, with your hands, with your legs, with your body, or with your mind. Again, we turn to the commentary, The Great Discourse on Blessings. Uh, Dr. Ari Obeyesikura mentions, in addition to knowledge, it is also a blessing to have learned and be uh, proficient in some type of art and craft, which should be wholesome and morally right. With an appropriate craft, one would be able to make an honest living and lead a healthy family life which will positively contribute to spiritual practice as well. When one has not learned a craft properly, one may be inclined to wrong practices to earn a living. Now, in the uh, Dika Janu Sutta, uh, or Conditions of Welfare, Anguttara Nikaya Book of It, here is an interesting uh, encounter with some lay people. Thus have I heard, once the, black, the exalted one of the Buddha was dwelling amongst the Goliaths in their market town named Kakarapata. Then Digajanu, a Goliath, approached the Buddha, respectfully saluted him, and sat on one side. Thus seated, he addressed the Buddha as follows. We, Lord, are laymen who enjoy worldly pleasure. We lead a life encumbered by wife and children. We use sandalwood of Kasi. We deck ourselves with garlands, perfume, and unguents. We use gold and silver. Today, we call that money. Now, to those like us, O oh Lord, let the Buddha preach the Dhamma. Teach those things that lead to will and happiness in this life and the will and happiness in the future life. Of course, this morning, we will not go through this whole sutta, which I probably in other sessions, we have other speakers have gone through also. But we'll touch on certain aspects of uh, things we can do to gain happiness in this life. Now, four conditions, the Buddha said, conduce to a householder's will and happiness in this very life. Which four? The accomplishment of persistent effort, the accomplishment of watchfulness, good friendship, and balanced livelihood. The important one we end up emphasize is what is the accomplishment of a persistent effort? Herein, by whatsoever activity a householder earns his living, whether by farming, by trading, by rearing cattle, by archery, by service under the king, or by any other kind of craft, to that he becomes skillful and is not lazy. Notice the font is extra large. So the emphasis is on being skillful at whatever uh, profession you choose to undertake and not be lazy. He is endowed with the power of discernment as to the proper ways and means. It means to do those things he is supposedly skillful in. He is able to carry out and allocate duties, especially in management and, uh, uh, and so on. This is called the accomplishment of persistent effort. So here too, the Buddha talks about putting effort. But in the past, the sutta is addressed to a lay person, not a spiritual person. But you can imagine for a monastic, similar advice would be also given. Now in the Segalovada Sutta, from the Dika Nikaya, Sutta number 31, 
here, many of you may be familiar. On one occasion, the Buddha was dwelling in the bamboo grove, a uh, squirrel century near Rajagaha in the kingdom of Magadha. Now, the Buddha rose early in the morning and went towards the town, ready for Pinter, Pinter Chara. And he met a young man. And he saw the young, young man in wet clothes and wet hair, paying obeisance or paying respects in the sixth direction. And the Buddha asked, Wherefore do you, young householder, rising early in the morning, departing from Rajagaha with wet clothes and wet hair, worship with joined hands these various quarters, the east, the south, the west, the north, the nadir, and the zenith. And the young man, Singala, mentioned, My father, Lord, while dying, said to me, The six quarters, dear son, you shall worship. And I, Lord, respecting, revering, reverencing, and honoring my father's word, Rise early in the morning and leaving Rajaka with wet clothes and wet hair, worship with joined hands these six quarters. Now, it is not thus, young householder, the six quarters should be worshipped in the discipline of the noble. And Sikala asks, How then should the six quarters be worshipped in the discipline of the noble? Now, moving quickly through the sutta, the sutta is quite long. After all, it's from the Dika Nikaya. Dika means long lectures. There are these six channels for dissipating wealth, which he does not pursue. That means a good person does not pursue, does not make sure he practices all these six channels of losing his wealth. And up to number six, there are young householders, these six consequences of being addicted to idleness. Notice is F. I didn't go through all six, but within number six also, there are six evil consequences. He does no work saying that it is extremely cold, so he cannot get up and do work. It is extremely hot, so he cannot do work. That it is too late in the evening. That it is too early in the morning. That it is extremely hungry. That he's too full. So these are the six excuses okay, for being idle. Living in this way, he leaves many duties undone. New wealth he does not get, and the wealth he has acquired dwindles away. So this is the person addicted to idleness, as forewarned in the Sikalovada Sutta. Moving on, well-grounded in discipline. Here we have a commentary on life's highest blessings by uh, Dr. R. L. Sonny. One, for one who leads the household, householder's life, this means abstaining from the 10 causes of unwholesome action. Now, 10 causes of unwholesome action. In some of, the, of you who have studied, uh, went for courses, you may call it the 10 uh, demeritorious actions or deeds. 10 demeritorious. Here, the author uses the theme, 10 causes of unwholesome action. The 10 should be abstained from so that one makes no evil karma or no evil action. Are karma by way of body, which comprises killing living beings, taking one is not given, wrong conduct in sexual desires. Karma by way of speech, foul speech, malicious speech, harsh speech, and gossip. Karma by way of mind, covetousness, ill will and wrong views. Three main categories. You will notice the grouping within karma by way of body is four. Uh, four is three. Uh, killing, stealing, and sexual desires. So there are three in the way of body. In the way of speech, there are four. In the way of mind, is three. So three, four, three add up to ten causes of unwholesome action. And Dr. Arya Sony continues, A layman who disciplines himself in this tent is rightly called an excellent person. People like this are sure to make further gains on the path whenever they make efforts. The moral discipline in the case of a monk is stricter than for a householder. He must train himself not to fall into various classes of fences laid down by the Buddha. So there are different, uh, what they call, rules of conduct for lay people compared to the monastics. 
Now, you would note that uh, Dr. R. L. Soni, although commenting about the advice given in the Maha Mangala Sutta, actually took the 343 aspect from the Salayaka Sutta, Majima Nikaya Sutta number 41. Here, I go through some aspects of this. Now, thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was wandering in the coastal country with a large Sangha of monks. And eventually, he arrived at the coastal Brahman village called Sala. Now, when they were seated, they said to the Blessed One, Master Gotama, what is the reason? What is the condition? Why some beings here on the dissolution body after death reappear in states of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, even in hell? So, in a way, the lay people are asking the Buddha, why is there? Uh, what they call some people who have uh, uh, great suffering in the here, here and hereafter. And the question continues. And what is the reason? What is the condition? Why some beings here on the dissolution of the body after that reappear in a happy destination, even in the heavenly world? So in a way, this particular sutta gives advice on how to avoid, uh, give advice to us, how to avoid future unhappy destinations or hell and how that we can gain rebirth in the heavenly land. Okay, this is the answer. Now, householders, it is by reason of conduct. Conduct means how you behave, your actions. Conduct not in accordance with the Dhamma, by reason of unrighteous conduct. That beings here on the decision of the body, after that, reappear in states of deprivation in an unhappy destination in perdition, even in hell. Notice there are different uh, grades of suffering. Okay, states of deprivation, unhappy destination, perdition, even in hell. Hell would be the nirayas, the lowest plane of existence. It is by reason of conduct in the in accordance with the dhamma, by reason of righteous conduct, that some beings here in the district of the body after that reappear in a happy destination even in the heavenly world. Now here Dhamma, uh, some people, may, most people will assume that Dhamma means the teaching of the Buddha. But here I would like to propose that Dhamma is referring to the natural laws of the universe. The universe is such, there are natural laws that certain actions not in the accordance with uh, uh, the natural laws, then you get rebirth in an unhappy destination. But if certain conduct are in accordance with this, those natural laws, that a person may be born in a happy destination, even in a he uh, heavenly world. So again, here you see the familiar 343 listing. Householders, there are three kinds of bodily conduct, not in accordance with the Dharma, unrighteous conduct. And dot, 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 four kinds of verbal conduct, not in accordance with the Dharma, Three kinds of mental conduct not in accordance with the Dhamma. And how are there three kinds of bodily conduct not in accordance with the Dhamma? Here, someone is a killer of living beings. He is murderous, bloody-handed, given to blows and violence and merciless to all living beings. He is a taker of what is not given. He takes as a thief and others chattels and property in the village or in the forest. He is given over to misconduct in sexual desires. He has intercourse with such women as are protected by mother, father, mother and father, brother, sister, relatives, as have a husband as entail a penalty, or also with those that are garlanded in, betrayal, in token of betrothal. Garlanded and to in token of betrothal means sort of the families have arranged that so and so will marry each other when they are old enough. So that is how there are three kinds of bodily conduct not in accordance with the Dhamma, unrighteous conduct. And how are there are three kinds of verbal conduct not in accordance with the Dhamma? Here, someone speaks falsehood. And what is falsehood? When summoned to a court, or to a meeting, or to his relative's presence, or to his guilt, or to the royal family's presence, and question as a witness does. So, good man, 
tell what you know. Then not knowing, he says, I know. Or knowing, he says, I do not know. Not seeing, he says, I see. Or seeing, he says, I do not see. In full awareness, he speaks falsehood for his own ends or for another's ends or for some trifling worldly end. And the picture on the right is one which many, I, I will assume most people have come across this, uh, what do you call cartoon, depicting someone who speaks falsehood. He speaks maliciously. He is a repeater elsewhere of what is heard here for the purpose of causing division from this. Or he's a repeater of this, of what is heard elsewhere for the purpose of causing division from those. And he is thus a divider of the united, a creator of divisions, who enjoys discord, rejoices in discord, delights in discord. He is a speaker of words that create discord. He speaks harshly. He utters such words as are rough, hard, hurtful to others, censurious of others, bordering on anger, and conducive to, and unconducive to concentration. He is a gossip, as one who tells that which is unseasonable, that which is not fact, that which is not good, that which is not the Dhamma, that which is not the discipline. And he speaks out of season, speech not worth recording which is unreasonable, indefinite, and unconnected with good. That is how there are four kinds of verbal conduct, not in accordance with the Dhamma, unrighteous conduct. And how are there three kinds of mental conduct, not in accordance with the Dhamma, unrighteous conduct? Here, someone is covetous. He is a coveter of another's chattels and property. Thus, oh, that what is another's were mine. Or he has a mind of ill will, with the intention of mind affected by hate. Thus, may these beings be slain and slaughtered. May they be cut off, perish, and be annihilated. Or he has wrong view, distorted vision. Thus, there is nothing given, nothing offered, nothing sacrificed, no fruit, and ripening of good and bad karmas. No this world, no another world, no mother, no father no spontaneously born beings, no good and virtuous monks and brahmans that have themselves realized by direct knowledge and declare this world and another world. That is how there are three kinds of mental conduct not in accordance with Dhamma, unrighteous conduct. Now here, now as in all suttas, the Buddha starts off with the negative. And of course, the Buddha continues with the positive. So householders, there are three kinds of bodily conduct in accordance with Dhamma, four kinds of verbal conduct in accordance with Dhamma, three kinds of mental conduct in accordance with Dhamma. Now here, someone abandoning the killing of living beings becomes one who abstains from killing living beings, with rod, with weapon, laid aside, gentle, Kindly, he abides, compassionate to all living beings. Abandoning of taking what is not given, he becomes one who abstains from taking what is not given. Abandoning misconduct in sexual desires, he abstains, he becomes one who abstains from misconduct in sexual desires. That is how the three kinds of bodily conduct in accordance with Dhamma and righteous conduct. And how are there four verbal conduct in accordance with Dhamma, righteous conduct? Abandoning false speech, it becomes one who abstains from false speech. So in the example the, the Buddha gives, so good man, tell what you know. Not knowing, he says, I do not know. Or knowing, he says, I know. Not seeing, he says, I do not see. Or seeing, he says, I see and so on. Abandoning malicious speech, he becomes one who abstains from malicious speech. And the key aspect of this particular uh, uh, abandoning of malicious speech is, he is thus a reuniter of the divider, a promoter of friendships 
enjoying concord, rejoicing in concord, delighting in concord. He becomes a speaker of words that promote concord. It means unity among different groups of people. Abandoning harsh speech, he becomes one who abstains from harsh speech. He is a speaker of such words as are innocent, pleasing to the ear, lovable, as go to the heart, are civil, desired by many, and dear to many. Abandoning gossip, he becomes one who abstains from gossip. Okay, He tells things which are seasonable, factual, good, that is, in accordance with Dhamma and the discipline, speech which is worth recording, which is reason and connected with good. That is how there are four kinds of verbal conduct in accordance with Dhamma, righteous conduct. And how are there three kinds of mental conduct in accordance with Dhamma? Here, someone is not covetous. He has no mind of ill will. And he has right view. That is how there are three kinds of mental conduct in accordance with Dhamma, righteous conduct. In the end, with all these advices, we are finally, uh, ultimately responsible for our own lives. And in yet another sutta from the Anguttar Nikaya Book of Five, the Buddha says, I am the owner of my deeds or actions and heir to my deeds. I inherit my actions. Deeds are my womb. Your prior actions determine where you are born. Hence, the different planes of existence. My relative, my refuge. It affects who will be your relatives in the next birth. Who will be your refuge? I shall be the heir of whatever deeds I do, whether good or bad. And how is karma made? Intention, I tell you, is karma. Intending one does karma by way of body, speech, and mind. Now, from the previous page as well as this page, it is clear that it is important, uh, very, very important for one to take care of your uh, future birth. Okay, we're not talking about enlightenment or nibbana yet. We are talking about what becomes of me in the future birth. You have the responsibility of doing that. It is very, very difficult for your relative to take care of you after you have passed away. Okay, dedication of merits have certain limits. But more importantly, when you know what to do, take care of yourself as per the advice given by the Buddha. We continue to well-spoken speech, pleasant speech. And clearly, this particular, uh, what they call, a blessing in the Mangala Sutta is overlapped with the previous section. Here, a commentary says, speech that is well-spoken would naturally avoid the four types of speech included in the 10 unwholesome activities or, or the 10 demeritorious actions. Instead, one should speak the truth and speak words that are affectionate and soothing to the listeners. One speech should also create concord and harmony among others instead of dividing them. And the words that are spoken should be useful to oneself and others with no idle chattering. Now, in this very short sutta, the Vacha Sutta, or which is Vacha means to speak or state, from the Agotura Nikaya Book of Five, monks, a statement endowed with five factors is well spoken, not ill spoken. It is blameless and unfaulted by knowledgeable people. Which five? It is spoken at the right time. It is spoken in truth. It is spoken affectionately. It is spoken beneficially. It is spoken with a mind of good will. So a, spoke, a statement endowed with these five factors is well spoken, not ill spoken. It is blameless and unfaulted by knowledgeable people. So that concludes this morning's, uh, uh, what I call, coverage of these four blessings from the Mangala Sutta, uh, blessing number seven, eight, nine, and ten. Now, as usual, in developing all these uh, blessings, things which we want to train ourselves, everything has to be taken gradually. We are not ninjas that giant jump can fly over to the second floor of a building. Uh, we can we are, we are not like uh, what I call 
inundated by the fast food craze. Everything must be instant, but everything in training has to be gradual. And the, in the Opo Sutta Sutta from the Udana 5.5, the Buddha says, just as the ocean has a gradual shelf, a gradual slope, a gradual inclination with a sudden drop off after a long stretch, in the same way, this Dhamma Vinaya or doctrine and discipline has a gradual training, a gradual performance, a gradual progression with a penetration to noxis or enlightenment only after a long stretch. So everything is step by step. Okay. And there must be consistent training and progression. Consistency is key after you have start to started. In the end, what are the teachings of the Buddha? In Dhammapada verse 183, the Buddha's advice, Sabba pa pusa akaranang, kusalasa upasampada, sachitta paridapanang, etang buddhana sasana, that we should avoid all evil, do good, purify our minds. This is the teaching of the Buddhas. So with that, Saddhammo tirang titatu, may the good doctrine long endure. Sabbe, Satta, Suki, Hontu. May all beings be happy. That's the end of my sharing this morning. Back to you. Thank you very much, Bhagananda, for today's sharing. Now, let's, since it's Chengbing period, let's uh, dedicate those marriages that we have accrued so far to all beings, whether they are seen and unseen. Akasata Chabumata Devanaga Mahitika Unyang Tamanumojitwa Chiram Rapkan to Loka Sasanang Etawata Amhehi Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sape Deva Sape Buddha Sape Sata Anumodantu Sapa Sampati Sitia let us recall in mind all our departed relatives, whether we know them or we don't know them. As we chant these verses. Idang me nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyatayo. Idang me nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyatayo. Idang me nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyatayo. Aspirations. Imina punya kame na mame bala samagamo. Satang samagamo ho tu yavanipana patia. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Just a gentle reminder, next week we won't have any sessions since everybody, most of us, will be attending the Cheng Beng. So thank you everyone for watching. For other videos, please visit the links below. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>